And joining us now from Israel are several Canadians who were either on board the flight or who met it on the tarmac. We're joined by Ariella Roringer, Candace Quinter, Bruce Leboff, and Sarah Gottlieb. Welcome to the CJN Daily, everyone. And wow, you must still be buzzing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, we'll start with the person who met the flight. Bruce, what did you do? Where were you? What was it like? First impressions. So look, it was amazing. I mean, we're very aware that many of these people have been waiting, you know, more than a decade to to make Israel their home. And uh, it was just a privilege. We were waiting in the, uh, in the hot sun for about 45 minutes, uh, but it was worth it. Uh, you know, an Ethiopian Airlines jet landed, was brought over for those who are familiar in the area of Terminal 1, which is the old terminal. Um, and, you know, with great drama, they opened the doors and, and uh, out they came. It was, really, it was really moving. And what did they do when they got off? What did you see? I, well, in a couple of cases, there were family members who were there. And of course, a, a, you know, a teary reunion. And we saw one woman, you know, lower herself to the ground to kiss the ground as she arrived, which was quite something. And um, it was, uh, everyone was just smiling. I think they were a little, I could say almost bewildered, uh, overwhelmed. Uh, you know, there were lots of us well-wishers with small Israeli flags, handing them out to them as they came down. Um, and they were just, they looked uh, tired, hot, bewildered, but excited. Uh, what about you, Candace? It's a long way from Vancouver. How, why did you go? It was always a dream to um, be part of, of you know, uh, of this type of, of experience, you know, to see these people that have been waiting, some of them decades, to, you know, reunite with their families and to what, you know, their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents have always told them to, you know, to be in Yerushalayim and to, you know, see them in Ethiopia at, in their homes and where they came from. And uh, even yesterday, you know, going to uh, morning service and listening to them all pray and daven just like we do with the Torah and the, you know, and the men laying to fill. And I mean, it's just, it was extraordinary. I can't even... Um, I'll start to cry if I, <laughs> if I tell you the, the feelings that are going on in our, in our hearts right now. It's okay. I want to hear feelings. Where was this prayer service being held? Um, well, they have a synagogue and a, what, what we would call a JCC, but it's dirt floors and benches. Um, you know, there's a little what they call Tama Torah, you know, attached to it and um, like a, what we would call a Jewish family services where they, you know, are feeding the kids under five but it's nothing like we're used to here in Canada. It's really third world. And, um, but they're, it's, you know, they're, they're just like us, you know, they, they are really the lost tribe and you see it, you see they are real, you know, real, real Jews, just like us. It's just so amazing. You know, they don't look like us, but they're exactly like us inside and out, you know, and it's, um, and, and their belief and their faith and their desire to come home to Jerusalem is, is, is phenomenal. You know, we say it at Pesach, you know, next, next year in Jerusalem, but they say it every day and every hour and every minute of their lives. I want to bring in Sarah for a minute. Tell me, did you get to actually do anything with uh, some of the um, uh, people that were on this flight to talk to them, sing with them? Tell me some stories. So I, I'll take it back to Gondar, where the synagogue that Candace just spoke about was. We went into their homes, and it's not a home like you and I would think of a home. It's a room with four people living in there, and some of them have been living in this room for eight years, waiting for the ability to come to Israel to be reunited with their families. I spoke with a man on the plane today who has been waiting 23 years to see his parents. And I said to him, so did you call your mother and tell her you're coming? He said, no, I'm, I've been waiting too long. I'm waiting until I land in Israel to say, mom, I'm home. And that just hit me so hard. I'm gonna break right now. The other thing that was so incredible was we had the opportunity on the plane to sit right beside all these Olim. And even though 
there was a language barrier. I mean, they don't speak English and except for the Shalom and Israel and Yerushalayim, there's not too much Hebrew, but they speak. But I sat beside a mother with two young boisterous kids. And of course we could bond over keeping kids happy on an airplane for five hours and the video screens weren't working. So they were crawling all over me and crawling all over her. And the excitement, as you could see Israel outside the window. And I said to her, Yisrael, Yisrael. And we hugged each other and started crying. Why? I will never, ever, ever forget this. My greatest landing in Israel ever. <laughs> Can you explain, uh, maybe Ariel, you want to give me a story and also uh, Candace, some of the stories that you saw of, you know, uh, just uh, hardship, because I know the country's in the middle of a civil war and we forget about that, but it's been going on. What did you see, if anything, and how did it impact these lives of the people you met? Anyone? There are a thousand Jews in the area that is part of the civil war and that area is blocked and those people cannot come to Gondar or Addis. Um, so we had no connection with those people. But as Sarah was talking about in Gondar, it, it, it really was a phenomenal experience to see how these people are living and to see the volume of people at the at synagogue services all praying and living for that dream of coming to, to Israel, it really was overwhelming. It wasn't like anything that I had ever pictured. When we talked about um, Jaffe providing nutrition for pregnant women and nursing women, we were you're talking about a fire pit with logs that that's how they're being fed that is the community center and as Scanda said it was dirt floors tin roofs uh it's um animals are just you know straying by so it's living in biblical times in some respects and so when we saw the faces of the people on the flight you can see the excitement and the trepidation at the same time for very obvious reasons. And it was it was really wonderful to see all the children, and um, and and to know what you know their their parents and grandparents were sacrificing for them to have a different life than what you know they had experienced in Israel and and all these you know you saw I think the youngest on the plane was one month old and the oldest was 80 uh, something. So it was multi-generational. Um, four people that were living in one room that we referred to earlier that we visited, they were paying rent of $32 a month. These people don't have that kind of income. Money was being sent by the son from Israel in order for the mother and the grandchildren to be able to survive until it was their turn to come to Israel. Uh, there isn't regular jobs other than police officers and, and the like. Uh, it's a very difficult life with a dream of having the realization of family reunification and creating a better life for their children and grandchildren. This, you are saying hardship, um, this is a transit camp that they're in or where did they come from and how did they get to the airport? The, these aren't transit camps. They are just people have come from villages and, and taken rooms and facilities. Some of the facilities are tremendously primitive. The ones that we saw, there were even more primitive. What does that look like? Tell me what it smells like. What does it look like? It's there's one bed in the room that the in the house we went to the matriarch would sleep in. Um, and then underneath there were sleeping, but underneath her bed were sleeping bags that got pulled out for three people to sleep on the floor. There was one chair in the room. Beside the chair was a gas stove. And so the mother, the, the matriarch of the family had a cell phone. So, and that's how she was communicating with her son who lived in Israel, who was sending money. And I said, well, you have a cell phone through translation. How are you charging it? And the grandson took me outside, pointed to the roof, climbed up to the roof and showed me that there was a solar panel to charge the phone there because they don't have electricity. 
the bathroom you couldn't call a bathroom it's one room it's a hole in the in the floor and a bucket beside it so you could stand on the side to pour water that had been gathered to wash yourself why should canadian like what is the role of canada's jewish community here in this in this operation and and fundraising and what have you you asked the question about the canadian jewish community i think it's incumbent on world jewelry right that we look after one another so whether it's someone from Gondor or Addis or Ukraine, you know, you know parts of Ukraine, um, we stand up for, for each other. That's first of all. But vis-a-vis uh, the involvement of, you know, basically the Jewish agency is responsible. It's the agent of the um, state of Israel, basically, for facilitating Aliyah, encouraging Aliyah, and then parts of Krita, of absorption. Um, the government can't possibly cover all of the costs, and even where they do, particularly for absorption and for Ethiopian uh, Olim in particular, given you know what you've just heard in terms of how people are living, they're going from a primitive third or second world you know society to a advanced technological first world environment, and and the cost to bring people if you were up to speed to not only be here, but but hopefully to succeed and thrive uh, is tremendous. Uh, the supports that they need, and and I think I agree absolutely. Um, you know, as as most immigrants do, they're sacrificing for future generations. But you know, in in many cases, you have the the patriarchs, matriarchs, and so on are maybe illiterate in their in their mother tongue, let alone you know coming to Israel to pick up. Hebrew and be literate in Hebrew and English. Um, so the costs are tremendous and, and part of the individual federated campaigns across the country uh, and you have representatives, you know, we had people from Montreal, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, and I'm not sure if there was anyone from Ottawa, but the, the point is all that money raised is going, part of that allocation process is through UI of Canada, which Ariella uh, heads and Steve's the staff person for, uh, that money gets aggregated and sent to Israel in support of the Jewish agency's work in this in this and, and many other core areas. Okay. Um, did any of you bring anything with you to give to them from Canada or anywhere or, or that you gave over? Um, Sarah, you're smiling. I'm smiling because we were actually told not to. Uh, they felt that that just encouraged not just the children who we were visiting, but other neighborhood children to come and beg. And they specifically told us not to. Once we were on the plane, I can tell you, we had bags of books of stickers and bags of candy to entertain the children for hours. And I, for one, had my entire face covered by the children with stickers. So it kept them happy since the TV screens weren't working. I don't know what's going to happen when the sugar rush, uh, they fall down from the sugar rush, but, uh, you know, <laughs> small what price to pay, candy? I think. What kind of candy yeah. do you bring specifically? Lollipops, chewy candy. I mean, I, I, I hope that uh, some of our money is helping to pay for dentistry work as well <laughs> after that. Did any of you want to just share another uh, impression, story, message? When we were landing, we were singing the words to a very well-known song, and it got, with the most poignant words were Shevet Achim Gam Yachad. We are all, brought, putting it basically, we are all together from one tribe. And really, as Jews across the world, but certainly across Canada, this is our tribe, the Jewish people. And these young faces that we saw on the plane are the future of Israel. And by supporting them, we're helping Jews all over the world. And maybe I could just add, I would say that, the, the, I mean, it's nothing short of miraculous when you hear where they've come from to, to where they are now, literally, you know, hours ago. Um, unbelievably powerful and moving. This is a snippet of what, of what you know, the, the Jewish agency is doing. Uh, had the privilege of going, you know, a month ago to the border in Poland on the border with Ukraine. And similar feelings of seeing the first thing you walk over that border is an Israeli flag uh, and the Jewish agency sign. So if you identify as Jewish, 
we're here for you. Thank you so much for quickly jumping on the Zoom and literally probably the first person you've talked to from the media since you got off the plane a couple of hours ago. So it's really a privilege to hear them. And thank you for being on the CJN Daily.